Good afternoon, and welcome to our Women's History Month celebration. My name is Lisa Fine. I'm the co-director for the Center for Gender and Global Context, and I'm also a professor in the Department of History. We are delighted this afternoon to welcome Estelle Friedman to our campus. Um, before I introduce her, though, I have a few thank yous. Um, first of all, the Center for Gender and Global Context has had quite a bit of support for this event, um, the Department of History, um, the MSU's Research Consortium on Gender-Based Violence, African and African American Studies Program, the College of Arts and Letters, and the Residential College and the Arts and Humanities all contributed to make this event possible, and we're very grateful for that support. In addition, members of the Jensen office have provided labor and support for this event. Um, thank you goes to, thank yous go to Galena Ostapau, our assistant, um, who took care of all of the logistics, uh, Duncan Tarr, right here, who created the flyer and was in charge of our social media around the event. John Shaw, who's standing over there, from the MSU Library, who is providing the audio taping. And Zoe Jackson, who's right here, who will be videotaping the whole thing. So thank you to all of you to make this something that will endure beyond just today. And now to introductions. Um, I know because there's going to be a bunch of, uh, there are a bunch of my students in this class, and I'm glad to see you all here, uh, that you probably have to leave around 4.15 and 4.20, and that's fine. But if there are still conversations going on, um, please just do so um, quietly and courteously. Okay, that's fine. Um, and now to the introduction. Estelle Friedman is a US historian specializing in women's history and feminist studies. She earned her PhD and MA degrees from, in history from Columbia University um, and her BA in history from Barnard College. She has taught at Stanford University since 1976 and is a co-founder of the program in feminist, gender, and sexuality studies there. Her research interests include focus on, a focus on the history of women and social reform, including feminism and prison reform, as well as the history of sexuality. It's no exaggeration to state that she is one of the founding mothers of the field of women's history, at least from my perspective she is, and an important pathblazer and innovator in the field of history of sexuality and the body. She is the recipient of multiple teaching awards and national prestigious grants, such as the Guggenheim Fellowship, American Council Learned Society Fellowship, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Center for Advanced Studies and the Behavioral uh, Studies Fellow, among many others. She has um, authored scores, scores of scholarly articles. She's the author or editor of 10 books, including The Essential Feminist Reader, published in 2007, which is an edited an anthology of 64 primary documents from feminist history around the world, spanning the 15th to the 21st centuries. She's also the author of Feminism, Sexuality, and Politics, 2006, a collection of eight previously published and three new essays, No Turning Back, The History of Feminism and the Future of Women, um, published in 2002, which explores feminism in the West and its relationship to broader movements for women's rights and social change throughout the world. Her newest publication is Redefining Rape, Sexual Violence in the Era of Suffrage and Segregation, Harvard University Press, which won the Emily Toth Award from the Popular Culture Association and American Culture Association, the Francis Richardson Keller Sierra Prize from the Western Association of Women's Historians, and the Darlene Clark Hine Award in African American Women's and Gender History from the Organization of American Historians. We are thrilled that she is here to help us commemorate Women's History Month and to share her new work with us. Please help me in welcoming Estelle Friedman. Thank you very much, um, Professor Fine, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, and especially I want to thank the, uh, set, uh, the Center for Gender and Global Context for your hospitality and kind of the day today. And happy Women's History Month, everybody. Yes. I'm glad to celebrate with you. Now, I'm, I'm going to be speaking historically about the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries, but I'm actually going to begin my historical presentation with one contemporary observation and something we might return to afterwards. And that is that the redefinition of rape has been much in the news of late. In fact, when I was finishing my book over the past couple of years, I was struck by what seemed to be an escalation 
in media attention to the politics of sexual violence. From, if you recall, the unfortunate phrase, legitimate rape, that was deployed in the 2012 senatorial campaign by Todd Aiken to justify limitations on abortion. He lost. Um, <laughs> to the exposés of the practice of so-called corrective rape against lesbians in South Africa, to the revision in 2012 of the definition of rape that had been used since 1927 by the Federal Bureau of Investigation Uniform Crime Reports. It has been revised so that now the term includes any form of forced sexual penetration of a man or a woman, as well as non-forcible rape. In 2013, the White House Council on Women and Girls issued a report calling for renewed action against rape, which was the occasion for President Obama to call national attention to sexual assault on college campuses. And in 2014, the California legislature, followed by New York State, redefined sexual consent as a positive statement of yes rather than a negative refusal of no. Now, I could go on with contemporary redefinitions of rape, including naming wartime rape, and I think immediately of uh, not only what is happening uh, under the control of ISIS, but also the recent exposés of rape by UN peacekeepers in Africa, uh, or the redefinition of what once was considered implicit consent, as we see in the Cosby trial. <coughs> We may be living in a moment of particularly intensive scrutiny of the legal and cultural meaning of sexual violence. But I want to show you that challenging the definition of rape has a very long history in the United States, one that has left a significant legacy for the ways that we think about the subject today. And so this afternoon, I'm going to recount parts of this history, focusing on the late 19th century and the early 20th century, a time when both women's rights and racial justice advocates contested the then narrow understanding of rape, namely as a brutal attack on a chaste white woman by a stranger, typically and increasingly portrayed as an African American man. In narrating efforts to expand that meaning of rape, I'm going to highlight three key points that run through my book. First, the historically fluid concept of rape. Second, its relationship to citizenship. And third, the particular historical contexts in which legal changes have occurred, as well as their limits. My first point, I'm going to say a little bit about each point before I go into my story. My first point, the fluidity of the definition of rape. Now this would seem obvious for those of you who study history, things change, but I think it's worth reiterating that rape is a highly malleable category in law and in culture. Different societies define which non-consensual acts they will condone, which they will criminalize, and then how forcefully they will prosecute the latter category. And those definitions change over the course of American history. Even as they change, though, keep in mind that powerful legacies of earlier constructions of rape continue to influence law and practice for generations. Now, for the record, the Anglo-American definition of rape in the 19th century was the carnal knowledge of a woman when achieved by force and against her will by a man other than her husband. For a child under the age of 10, the law did not require force or, in principle, raise the question of consent. Over that age, both violent physical force and proof of physical resistance were critical in court to proving rape, as was the prior chastity of the accuser. In the American context, rape law exempted not only marital, but also master-slave relations. And even after emancipation, the presumption that black women could not be raped long persisted. Now, I will be discussing efforts to change these meanings, but I also want to give a corollary to the point about the fluidity of rape, and that is the influence of structures of privilege. 
in revising the definition of prosecution of this crime. Who lived in fear of being raped? And who lived in fear of being accused of being a rapist? These have depended heavily on social hierarchies, most clearly of race and gender, but also of age and of ethnicity. From the late 18th to the late 19th centuries, for example, the dominant cultural understanding of which men posed the threat of sexual assault changed from Indians to white desperados and tramps to southern blacks. And the latter category is a process I'll refer to as the racialization of rape. Although the legal definition remained narrowly heterosexual, by the early 20th century, new immigrants and homosexual men came to be seen as threats to boys. By uh, each of these constructions, I will argue, deflected attention away from sexual crimes committed by elite heterosexual white men. So that's a, just a point about fluidity. My second and related theme is that the changing definition and prosecution of rape in American history has been critical to the construction of citizenship. And I mean by that, who was to be included in and who was excluded from privileges and obligations such as voting, jury service, office holding, as well as access to due process of law. Let me explain how this works, this connection to citizenship. So first of all, on a practical level, the exclusion of women, African Americans, and certain immigrants from voting, lawmaking, and courtrooms, whether as jurors, lawyers, even as observers at times, excluded. All of those exclusions contributed to the immunities enjoyed by white men when they were accused of having seduced, harassed, or assaulted women of any race. They were the ones making the laws, enforcing the laws, acting as the judges, jurors, lawyers, etc. So this exclusion of certain groups, this lack of rights, lack of rights made those groups vulnerable to both rape and to rape accusations. So that's practically how citizenship interacts. Then there's the rhetorical level. The constructions of black women as always consenting, white women as duplicitous, and black men as constant sexual threats all justified the very limitations on citizenship that reinforced white men's sexual privileges. For women and African Americans were seen as lacking the morality and the self-control necessary to citizenship. In short, our understandings of sexual assault contribute to the boundaries placed upon rights, reinforcing the economic inequalities that these boundaries have historically sustained. I also address a third theme, and that is why certain groups contested the meaning of sexual violence when they did and to what effect. And I've identified a series of challenges to the dominant definitions of rape, particularly on the part of white women and African American men and women, during what I call the era of suffrage and segregation in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For in this period, each of these groups mobilized to gain inclusion as full citizens, whether in the women's suffrage movement or in black resistance to Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement. Now, those groups formed no unified movement. Uh, they were racially parallel rather than cooperative efforts. Uh, the political actors employed a range of the strategies that are available to disenfranchised interest groups. Uh, they had to rely on the media, on uh, signing petitions to legislatures, on legal advocacy, advocacy in the courts, as well as seeking more powerful allies in their effort to contest the dominant understanding of sexual violence. Now, at times, some of them succeeded in revising either legal or cultural definitions of rape, but often with very mixed results, as I'm now going to illustrate with three sets of examples. First, uh, start with women's rights, then I'll turn to racial justice, and then to child saving. The earliest critiques of female sexual vulnerability took a variety of forms, but as a whole, I think they illustrate both the political insights and the political limits of white women's efforts to expand the definition of rape beyond the narrow scenario of a violent attack by a stranger. 
Let me start in the antebellum decades before the Civil War. And this is a time when northern female moral reformers targeted white men who seduced single female acquaintances. That is, they in some way got them to have sex, uh, and then they did not marry them. That's one set I'll talk about. After the Civil War, suffragists both decried rape and they decried the double standard of criminal justice. They blamed these problems on women's lack of full citizenship and they demanded enfranchisement and jury service for women in order to ensure fair prosecution in rape cases. I'll also talk about the late 19th century radical free lovers who first articulated a woman's right to refuse marital sex. We find by the turn of the 20th century, suffragists rallying behind statutory rape reform to increase the age below which a young woman or girl could not legally consent to sex. Above that is the age of 10. Now, all of the things that I'm going to describe, you'll see, target white men's sexual privileges, but none of them question the concurrent racialization of rape that I'll be discussing after. So the northern white women who began to rethink the requirements of force and resistance in the prosecution of rape, did so in the early um, 19th century within a context of really heightened attention to the meaning of female virtue. A chaste reputation was becoming requisite for a middle class woman to be able to raise virtuous children and foster morality within her husband. If she was sullied through sexual relations before marriage, she was not pure, she suffered a loss of honor that came at an economic cost. That is, she may not be able to marry, she would be dependent on her family, or she would have to become wage earning, uh, and a wage earning woman at the time made moralists fear that she would devolve into prostitution, especially with her ruined reputation, since there were so few opportunities for female wage earning. Chastity, in other words, became a kind of survival strategy for those women who embraced the ideal, who aspired to middle class status. And seduction represented a threat to maintain that status. And so we see, it beginning in the 1840s, moral reformers, many of them intent on staunching the spread of prostitution in cities like Boston and New York, beginning to petition state legislators to increase the penalties for seduction. They railed against the licentious man who persuaded or coerced a woman to consent to sex outside of marriage. Now, this was typically by the false promise of marriage, since there had been a long history of premarital courtship that it might involve some sexual relations, and yet the expectation was, especially if there was a pregnancy, that there would be a marriage. In the newly mobile society, with less familial and church control, more and more young men were promising, don't worry, if anything happens, we'll get married, and then, you know, heading west or getting out of town. Uh, so sometimes it was false promise of marriage, but also many of the cases involved things like a drugged drink or some other deception to have a woman lose her virtue, as they said. And yet, she was left to pay the full costs of the ruined reputation or often an out of wedlock birth. There were already civil statutes that provided the remedy of a financial compensation to the family of the woman who was seduced and abandoned. The father got paid because he was losing the labor of his daughter as a servant in his household. Eventually, women got the right to sue on their own behalf for uh, seduction. Um, but this was a civil uh, suit. There was also an interesting loophole. Um, the laws allowed the accused man to escape punishment by agreeing to what the British feminist Mary Wollstonecraft referred to as a left-handed marriage. In other words, if you marry her, you don't have to pay. And actually, there's a remnant of this system around the world today in the protests that you may be aware of over the sort of forced marriage of women who've been raped to preserve the honor of their family, that if they marry the rapist, she won't be punished, and she won't lose her honor. Now, that's how seduction is <clears throat> supposed to work. But in some cases, seduction represented what scholars call a legal fiction that stood for the act of forcible sex, with plaintiffs and defense lawyers agreeing, well, we'll file a civil seduction suit rather than a criminal rape complaint. 
given the often thin line between consent and coercion, and given the reluctance of juries to convict men of rape, especially with acquaintances. Successful seduction suits offered a, a legal tool that would warn men that they could not necessarily get away with forced sex. Moral reformers wanted legislatures to take these acts more seriously, to recognize they weren't just about a consensual premarital relationship gone bad. They also included acts of force. And so beginning in the 1840s, they began to petition for the criminalization of seduction. By 1900, over half the states had added criminal penalties of imprisonment along with fines. Now, I just want to read the language of the New York State Bill. Listen to the way it illustrates a recognition that seduction applied to women who were, quote, compelled to yield to superior brute force, quote. That is, she eventually consented, but under some kinds of force or duress. That would be a seduction, not a rape. Anti-seduction laws then provided some legal leverage when male acquaintances coerced or assaulted single white women, but they had serious limits. For one, they fortified a gender ideology that defined women by their sexual purity, for the laws typically required chastity on the part of the accusing woman. <coughs> Criminal seduction laws could reinforce racial as well as gender ideologies. They applied almost entirely to white women, given stereotypes at the time about black female immorality. They further contributed, I believe, to the racialization of rape because, think about it, white men accused of rape were more likely to be taken to court for either attempted rape or seduction, which implies somehow that they weren't violent, forceful crimes while African-American men were more likely to be the ones seen as the violent rapists. Uh, white men who were convicted of attempted rape or seduction may serve a short prison term. Black men convicted of rape faced long prison terms or execution, and by the late 19th century, the threat of lynching. After the Civil War, neither white moral reformers nor white suffragists, even former abolitionists among them, addressed this growing racialization of rape and lynching. But the sexual abuse of white women and the double standards perpetuated by courts during rape trials did provide grist for the suffragist mill. As the title of an article in the suffragist journal, The Woman's Journal, explained in the 1880s, and I quote, Women's deprivation of rights, the source of men's crimes. Only full citizenship, the paper repeatedly insisted, would prevent the physical and sexual violence that suffragists Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell cataloged in their newspaper column, which was called Crimes Against Women. According to Stone, the only way to have these crimes against women punished as they deserve is to have women share the law-making power. Along with the vote, female jury service would achieve fairer treatment of women in court. And again, I quote, this is from a writer in the Woman's Standard. Women alone are the peers of women. And the writer alludes to, and I quote, certain criminal proceedings in which women alone can understand what has been committed and what resisted. That is a euphemism for rape. Although they saw equal rights in the public realm, most 19th century suffragists avoided the subject of the marital exemption in rape law. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone occasionally referred to the problem of sexual abuse within marriage in private. But only the radical free lovers publicly denounced a husband's right to have sex with a non-consenting wife. Because of this right, for example, Victoria Woodhull referred to marriage as a form of, quote, sexual slavery. And in the anarchist journal Liberty, Lillian Harmon, she herself had been arrested in Kansas because of her free love or common law marriage, uh, Harmon questioned the limitation of rape laws by pointing out that a husband, and I quote, can go to the brothel and commit a crime which will, if he is prosecuted, send him to the penitentiary but if he comes home the same night and commits the same crime on his wife, he will not be troubled by the law. 
Some free lovers explicitly linked marital rape with limitations on female citizenship. Give us a hand at the lawmaking, a married woman wrote in 1886, welcoming, and I quote, an opportunity to wipe from statute books such infamous laws as the one that a married man cannot rape his wife, end of quote, 1886. In addition to their willingness to name marital rape, the free lovers differed with suffragists over the revision of statutory rape laws, which was a major goal of temperance and social purity uh, advocates at the end of the 19th century. Suffragists argued that increasing the age of consent above the common law threshold of 10 years would make it easier to prosecute men who recruited young women into prostitution and also to protect, protect girls from sexual ruin. Now this is a time when most women cannot vote, they cannot run for office, they can't serve on juries, and yet they succeeded in convincing male legislators to expand the definition of underage sex. By 1920, almost every state had raised the age of consent to between 16 and 18 years old. Like anti-seduction laws, the stricter statutory rape laws provided greater courtroom leverage for young women. It took that consent defense out of the trial. And most suffragists championed the reform. But these laws had limits as well. They emphasized women's dependence, their need for protection, as the free lovers complained. Lillian Harmon, who had married at age 16 without benefit of church or state, believed that the laws constituted, in her words, the surrender of the selfhood of the young women of America. Rather than seeking protection by the state, this anarchist invoked her right to profit from my mistakes. Now, she did believe that after a woman reached the age of puberty, she um, sexual relations should be, uh, not be criminalized. Harmon shared with social purists and suffragists a rejection of sexual violence and a belief in a single standard of morality for men and women. But to achieve equality, Harmon wanted to extend to women the sexual freedom enjoyed by men. I quote, not by making man a slave with woman, but by making woman free with man, not by leveling down but by leveling up to the male free love standard. In the 19th century, Lillian Harmons was a rare female voice critical of the underlying ideology of protecting female purity in anti-seduction and age of consent law. In the early 20th century, however, elements of, of her vision of sexual self-sovereignty and even of gender-neutral sexual mores began to gain more traction. By the 1920s, both working and middle class young women were seeking sexual adventures, and jurists and doctors chafed against the protective laws as unfairly punishing young men. Some post suffrage feminists agreed with them. I think it's one of the paradoxes of achieving formal rights as voters that, along with shedding state protection, modern young women gained reputations as flirts and seducers themselves in a sense, leveling up, in Harmon's words. In the process, though, those who did report incest, harassment, or assault often faced the kinds of strict scrutiny and disbelief that had motivated the earliest reformers to strengthen legal protections. That is, they faced the assumption of consent. By the mid-20th century, calls to reform rape laws concentrated on protecting men from duplicitous and hysterical women. It was really only the revival of feminism after the 1960s that reversed this direction and began to put women's experiences at the center of a political analysis of rape. White women tried to redefine rape to include nonviolent and coercive relationships with acquaintances. But black women and men, and this is my second example, faced far greater challenges in undermining the racial construction of sexual violence. So deeply had the racialization of rape taken hold in American law and culture. Views that black women had no moral virtue to defend or that black men posed a constant threat to white women's purity justified the exclusion of African Americans from full citizenship after emancipation. I should note that the image of the rapist as an aggressive black man had originated much earlier, actually during the colonial era, 
We know that in 1765, for example, in, a, in, in an index to the laws of, the, uh, of Maryland, the index uh, entry for rape said, see Negroes. Now, at that time, black men were not yet considered a threat to all white women. But African American men were more likely to be convicted and executed when accused of rape than were white men. The notion of rape as, quote, the Negro crime, and that's a very typical headline in the 19th century, and a crime typically perpetrated against white women, persisted throughout that century, reinforced by the press and by political rhetoric, especially after the end of Reconstruction. Lynching rested in large part on the escalating myth that free black men threatened white women's safety and honor, a fear that intensified because slavery no longer ensured white dominance. As many of you know, between the 1880s and the 1930s, lynching claimed thousands of black lives. The eminent historian and scholar W.E.B. Du Bois captured the centrality of sexual assault to the reestablishment of white supremacy in the South when he later wrote, the charge of rape against colored Americans was invented by the white South after Reconstruction to excuse mob violence and then became the recognized method of re-enslaving blacks. Even though most lynchings had nothing to do with sexual assault, invoking the specter of interracial rape helped protect mobs from criticism while simultaneously portraying black men as incapable of the rationality and moral control required for citizenship. In other words, it was used to reinforce disenfranchisement. Now, I spend a good deal of time in my book on efforts to defend black men from false rape accusations. But for now, I want to focus on a parallel argument made by racial justice advocates, namely that black women deserve justice when they were assaulted by white men. Identifying white men as rapists became a key strategy in the anti-lynching movement that was gathering momentum during the early decades of the Great Migration, particularly in the first um, three decades of the 20th century. Naming black women as victims of interracial rape served a dual purpose. First of all, to undermine part of the justification for lynching by showing that it's not only black men who rape, and secondly, by demanding justice for the black women who had been assaulted by white men. And both of these efforts, I think, advanced the African-American quest for political rights. Redefining rape to include black victims was really a daunting task at the beginning of the 20th century. A little bit earlier, in the decade before she became the leading African-American critic of lynching, the journalist Ida B. Wells explained, quote, among the many things that have transpired to dishearten the Negroes in their effort to attain a level in the status of civilized races has been the wholesale, contemptuous defamation of their women. Wells famously insisted, quote, virtue knows no color line. And Northern black women's clubs <coughs> inspired rejected the dominant white cultural belief that African-American women willingly engaged in promiscuous sexual relations and thus could not be raped. In the 1890s, these club women initiated a quest for sexual respectability and a single standard of justice. One of them, Florida Ruffin Ridley, wrote in the movement's journal, The Woman's Era, we read with horror of two different colored girls who have recently been horribly assaulted by white men in the South. We should regret any lynchings of the offenders by black men, but we shall not have occasion. Adding, should these offenders receive any punishment at all, it would be a marvel. Along with these black women's club members, the black press took a leading role in exposing the double standard of justice in rape cases. At a time when the majority of rape reports in white newspapers featured black assailants, African-American newspapers publicized the underreporting of white on black rape. Take the Baltimore Afro-American, for example, <coughs> bold face headline that reads, not a single daily paper has mentioned the rape of a 12-year-old, quote, colored girl by a white man, while every daily paper in the city carried black headline news articles 
about the rape of a 16-year-old white girl by a, quote, colored man. The African-American press self-consciously attempted to compensate for this bias. White gentleman commits rape. The Chicago Defender headlined a 1911 article about a Portland, Oregon assault with the subhead, that's all right, it was on a colored girl permitted by the United States government and the Confederacy. Reports of white men's attacks upon black women, which pointed out both northern and southern assailants, regularly inverted the racial tropes that pervaded the white press. So instead of Negro rapist, headlines in the black press followed the phrase white man with verbs such as charged, rapes, held, attempts, or assaults. The lead to one report epitomized the message, quote, the ability to rape and the desire to commit such an act is not copyrighted by any particular race. The African-American press also monitored police and court proceedings, foreshadowing the legal strategies that would become important in the civil rights movement from the 1930s onward. The press complained about the unequal application of capital punishment for rape, pointing out what they called cases in contrast in sentencing. Black journalists celebrated anything that unsettled the association of black men as rapists. It wasn't our race this time in beastly role, the Chicago Defender boasted in 1922, when two white men were jailed for the rape of a 12-year-old Negro girl in North Carolina. After World War I, the black press also targeted white men known as mashers, who approached, insulted, or tried to pick up women in northern cities. Well, for over a decade, suffragists have been complaining about these white male harassers, but the white press had kind of lost interest. But the black press began to elaborate in the 20s and 30s on the racial dynamics of street harassment as part of their broader effort to redefine sexual assault to include black women as victims. Now, black women in the South had long endured sexual insults from white men as they traveled, but they had had little recourse for complaints. The Northern Migration, the mounting political consciousness known as the New Negro, these raised expectations that African American women could move more safely in integrated public space. And so you see in the 1920s and 30s, the black papers targeting white men who sexually insulted or approached African-American women on the streets. Writers in the Baltimore Afro-American often applied a derogatory slang for whites, referring to them as ofe mashers, a term that translates best, I think, as white trash mashers. Masher accounts in the black press often express admiration for working women who defended themselves, such as plucky Miss Boyer, who fought off a white masher when he tried to embrace her in the elevator car that she was operating in a hotel. And she had the, um, the wherewithal to uh, whatever floor she was on to open the car, and people all saw this man trying to uh, assault her, essentially. And he's actually arrested, and she's the hero of the story. When police arrested and courts convicted white men who harassed black women, the African-American press celebrated. But the rhetoric in the press and the reports of court victories suggest that by the 1930s, at least a small wedge had appeared in the racialization of rape, allowing some black women to become believable victims and some white men to be punished for interracial rape, attempted rape, or harassment. The naming of these assailants served the goals of the larger anti-lynching movement, simultaneously empowering African-American women's quest for sexual respectability and sexual safety. These efforts, too, had their limits. For the focus on interracial rape increasingly drew attention away from instances of intraracial rape. There was much more reporting on black and black rape in the late 19th century than there would be after the 1920s. Why? It is a very controversial issue within the black community to feed into the image of the black man as rapist. And so there was a silence around interracial rape. I have one more example that I want to share with you. And that is the identification of certain men as sexual threats to boys in the early 20th century. 
Now, this is less well known than the racialization of rape, but it similarly contributed to contracting possibilities for citizenship. Concerns about the sexual vulnerability of boys emerged within the complex context of progressive era reform, a movement that included a range from child-saving impulses to nativism and immigration restriction, and also included the emergence of what I've called sexual liberalism, the beginning of an embrace of sexuality outside of reproductive relationships. By recognizing boys as objects of sexual seduction or victims of assault, doctors, jurists, and social scientists were contesting a long-standing Anglo-American definition of rape as between a man and a woman, as purely heterosexual. They represented an early move towards the gender-neutral rape laws of the late 20th century. At the time, though, sexually vulnerable children began to supplant adult women in the discourse on sexual assault. While immigrants and homosexual men became increasingly associated with child predation. While African American men had been overrepresented in rape prosecutions for some time, they were actually rarely charged with sodomy maybe because of the cultural associations of black men with hypermasculinity rather than effeminacy, but certain foreign-born men did become associated with perversion, as it was called, reflecting in part the native sentiments that contributed to the enactment of immigration reform during the 1920s. And then, after the 19, during the 1930s and after, there was a series of panics over child sex murders, um, and that's when the newly emerging figure of the homosexual began to replace the immigrant sodomite as the primary sexual peril for boys. Sodomy law was critical to this process because rape law covered only heterosexual relations. Sodomy had seldom been used to punish consensual relations in the 19th century, but sodomy statutes did allow the prosecution of non-consensual sexual acts between men, particularly if they included force. And the charges that were made in the 19th century often involved relationships between a man and a boy or youth. In that sense, sodomy law served as a kind of unofficial age of consent mechanism for male, male sexual relations. At the turn of the 20th century, and this is in the context of child saving movements, uh, concerns about the vulnerability of children, concerns about urban vice, you see a spike in arrest for sodomy particularly cases involving minors, uh, particularly in American <coughs> cities. Now first, the expanding discourse on sexual relations between men and boys often targeted recent immigrants. This is sort the end of the period of mass immigration from Eastern Southern Europe, also included um, immigrants from South and East Asia. The demonization of foreigners as sexually immoral had originally focused on women as potential prostitutes, uh, who should be kept out of the country, or on Jewish or Chinese men as pimps and traffickers. But concerns <coughs> about immigrant immorality did include same-sex relations. West Coast nativists, for example, warned that the Chinese would bring paganism, incest, and sodomy, as well as miscegenation, to America. There's one very telling uh, <coughs> case. In 1909, a California physician treated several teenage boys for rectal gonorrhea. And he blamed this condition on sodomitical practices that he claimed were once rare, but, quote, since the influx of foreigners from those countries where unnatural practices are common, more cases are now seen. Attributing to immigrants a penchant for sexual perversion drew upon ideas of the early sexologists, such as Richard von Croft Ebbing uh, from Germany, whose theory of racial degeneracy associated perversion with what he called primitive races, the lower classes, and poor immigrants. In the 19th century, American newspapers had rarely reported sodomy cases. But during the progressive era in the early 20th century, the press occasionally exposed queer subcultures covering incidents such as a 1912 Portland, Oregon sex scandal. There's, there's this big police crackdown 
um, and dozens of men, most of them white middle class men, were arrested for sodomy. Some of them have been socializing together in private drag parties in people's homes. Now, the, although the youngest of those arrested was age 19, the press and the court highlighted the danger posed to youth. Some Oregon politicians called for harsh punishment, including the sterilization of perverts. And one Portland resident suggested that authorities were being too lenient with the men. A letter to the editor of a local paper stated that, quote, if these degenerating practices were committed by Greeks or Hindus, end of quote, there would have been calls to drown them in the Willamette River. <laughs> in fact, Greeks and Hindus were more likely to be seen as perverse male predators. Although Greek immigrants represented less than 1% of the population of Portland at the turn of the 20th century, they appeared in over 11% of the arrests during the 1912 sex scandal. Authorities became particularly alarmed about, quote, immoral boys who pander to the passions of vicious Greeks. This association um, may have formed because Mediterranean cultures allowed some physical and even sexual relations among men, or because skewed sex ratios among primarily male immigrants from Greece and Italy, like those from China and South Asia, might create the opportunity for some sex, same-sex relations. But whatever the source of this idea, the insinuation of perversity could have serious implications. In, influencing eligibility for entry into the US and ultimately the possibility of citizenship. In the early 20th century, sexual perversion itself was not an explicit basis for excluding immigrants, but officials found reasons to deny entry to those they suspected. Uh, for example, a doctor who was examining a young Greek man in 1912 warned against admitting those with deformed genitalia because, quote, they may be sexual perverts. There was a big um, US Immigration Commission report in 1911 uh, on the traffic in women concerning about prostitution and trafficking. And the report called for stricter restrictions in immigration, quote, applied with even greater rigidity in the case of men. Immigration officials lamented the fact that moral perverts, as they called them, were not specifically excluded by the law. The restrictive immigration legislation that took effect in the 1920s may have diffused some of these concerns, but as I mentioned, beginning in the 30s, a full-blown moral panic over the threat posed to children by adult men led to a spate of new laws and specialized institutions to control what were called their uncontrolled desires. The ethnic child predator began to give way to the sexual psychopath portrayed as a white man who needed psychiatric attention rather than prison. By the post-World War II era, when gay male urban cultures became more vibrant and more visible, the image of psychopathic homosexuals who threatened young boys helped fuel anti-gay hysteria and sent some men to psychiatric prisons with indeterminate sentences. I think this reconfiguration suggests how heavily the redrawing of boundaries in the name of protecting children depended on perceptions of larger social threats, whether of immigrants or of homosexuals. Like the demonization of African American men as violent rapists, the associations first of certain new immigrants and then of homosexual males with child sexual abuse masked other forms of assault committed by native born white men including heterosexual rape and incest. And I think this history also helps explain why, by the end of the 20th century, for example, in response to the Anita Bryant Save the Children campaign of the 1970s, rejecting the association with child predators would become important to the gay rights movement. I have surveyed women's rights, racial justice, and child-saving influence on past redefinitions of rape. I hope that in doing so, I have convinced you of the fluidity of the concept, of its relationship to citizenship, and to the complex legacies of any efforts at reform. In our own time, as I mentioned at the outset, the term rape has expanded to include non-forcible as well as violent acts. 
committed by and upon members of any gender or race, regardless of marital status. Men who once enjoyed immunity from prosecution by virtue of their social status, I'm thinking here of clergy, teachers, coaches, now face closer scrutiny about their abuse of girls and boys, of young men and women. Despite this attention, it's clear to me that earlier constructs remain deeply embedded in our culture and that the benefits of the redefinition of rape have been unequally distributed. The underreporting of rape, the racial profiling of perpetrators, the ethnic stereotyping of immigrants, the silencing of sexually abused children, and the victim blaming that attributes assault to women's clothing or their past sexual histories all persist. Today, however, the protests waged by those once on the political margins seeking citizenship have turned into mainstream policy debates. And I think it's not surprising that female and minority legislators have taken the lead in calling national attention to sexual violence, for example, in the military and on college campuses. And it is not surprising that in the wake of the revival of feminism after the 60s, a dedicated anti-rape movement emerged, gaining momentum just when women gained greater political and economic authority. My research suggests strongly that contestations over the meaning of sexual violence will continue as long as social inequalities, particularly those based on gender and race, characterize American life. In the meantime, past definitions will continue to haunt rape reform, at least until we recognize the depth of their historical legacies. Thank you. And I'm happy to hear your reactions, questions, or comments. Well, especially the students in <laughs> Professor Vine's class, guys. Did, did you say there was extra credit for asking no. questions? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, just a lot of encouragement to it. <laughs> yes. I'm not a student. Sorry. That's quite right. No apology needed. Gaining more um, excitement if I, I break the ice. Um, you mentioned this was a fantastic talk, and um, I think Sarah from the Western London Briggs and uh, the history department. You mentioned race and class, and that was beautifully done. You, you briefly touched upon class, and you talked about working women. And I wondered if you could, if in your book you expand on this, um, about kind of uh, these attitudes towards working women being related to um, their chastity. Sure. And I just was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, because you, sure. I don't know if in your book you, you expand on that. Yeah. One way that it's very central to the story, really connecting those first two parts around um, white women and uh, issues of racialization of rape, this isn't the whole answer to it, but is in the South. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but um, the idea, say in the early 19th century, um, not all white women shared in the class privilege of being presumed to be pure, innocent, rapeable. So working class women, uh, immigrant women at the time, this would have been true in the North also, but in the South, sort of poor white women, had a um, tarnished reputation to begin with and were just not considered as pure. And so you find examples where even a black man accused of rape by a poor white woman, that her reputation might come up and she may not be believed. Or if even if he's convicted, the sentence would be influenced by her reputation because she wasn't a middle class pure woman. That will change after emancipation with the rise of Jim Crow and the racialization of rape. And in a sense, the race privilege of the presumption of purity of women is extended across class lines in the South. And you can see this into the 20th century. Uh, in fact, I think a, there's a whole chapter in my book on Scottsboro, 
on the case from the 1930s where this is a critical issue because two very poor white working class women with, with questionable morals, in fact they had sold themselves sexually, they were hungry, they were riding the rails, they made false rape accusations against black men. And in a court, repeatedly in courts in the South, judges basically kept to the line that had emerged in the late 19th century, which is any time a white woman has sex with a black man, we presume rape. There can be no consent. So they believed that. Even after one of the women recanted her story and said it was a lie, they couldn't overturn. I mean, they eventually overturned convictions on other grounds, not, but, but this had been so extended. However, that case and the publicity around it, um, it there was a huge mobilization in the North, and actually internationally, because the Communist Party became involved in the defense of the young men, uh, really kind of drew attention to the, 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 the left really um, saying, you know, why are you believing this poor white trash? I mean, in fact, actually, writers on the left were very torn about what are we doing about these women? What do we do about, do we go back now to the lying white trash story? And in a way, if you read Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will, she comes down very hard on the left for sort of throwing, you know, uh, just, oh, you do not believe these women. So there's this change story about class. The South, it gets played out particularly. The other place where I think it's really important is as more and more women go into factory work, uh, wage labor, uh, immigrant women, often the daughters of immigrants in the early 20th century, there's much more opportunity for workplace, both harassment and assault. So some of the cases that I read involved these work, this kind of workplace. That, it's not to say that middle class and, and working class women might have been equally vulnerable in public space, but within, at that time, the workplace became another layer of vulnerability when you are beholden for your paycheck and for your job to a male boss and the boss is ruining really Interestingly, the masher story that I alluded to, and there's a, there's a chapter in the book about the masher, and I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody wants. Um, both working class and middle class women, in a sense, uh, combined to claim the right to walk safely in public space. Working class women have to get to their jobs. More middle class women are going shopping. More middle class, even some sort of aspiring middle class uh, young women are becoming secretaries and clerks. There's the department store clerks. There's, there's women, class mixture, gender mixture in the streets. And the reaction to these women in the streets is what we now call street harassment, what they called mashers at the time. So you see both working class and middle class women fighting back and calling for an end to this and calling for protection. And one of the things that came out of their movement in the era of suffrage was um, police women. The first police women were um, police matrons who were appointed largely to patrol the streets and you know, sometimes go undercover. And when men mashed, they went to jail. Uh, so that, there was a very interesting cross class there, and there was a, one of my favorite pieces of that is just you know women in Chicago. I don't know if it happened in other cities, like training physically uh, in the way that the 1970s women's self defense movement would eventually proselytize more broadly. So those are some episodes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to clarify. You said at the um, end when the black press was representing, uh, really calling out the. Well, the master, yeah. the master stories. Yeah. You said that attention was drawn away from interracial rape or uh, intraracial rape? Intraracial rape. In other words, black on black rape. Okay. So um, after emancipation, during the during Reconstruction, uh, Southern laws changed so that the rape laws were no longer race specific. So legally, formally, black women could now go to court and accuse men of rape. And the accounts of those cases, they did bring cases, but they were largely against black men. Some were against white men. They didn't usually win, but sometimes they won and sometimes they lost in the case of that, uh, against black men. So there is the issue of intraracial race. And there were black um, commentators 
who spoke to the issue. I can't remember if it was Du Bois, Anna Julia Cooper, Anna Julia Cooper other writers of the early 20th century, uh, who mentioned that you know black women not only have to deal with white men, but they also sometimes have to deal with black men. And so there was an awareness. But what I found is that disappeared from the press by the 20s and 30s as the increasing attention to white women, and particularly after Scottsboro. Uh, the press just became so much more interested in um, the defense of black men falsely accused by white women. And there was, again, an effort to not feed into the stereotype of the black male rapist. And that remained an issue throughout the 20th century, and it may even remain an issue today. Like, do you call the police on someone of your own race knowing what's going to happen? Um, how does your gender and your race loyalty play out in that situation? <coughs> And I think the press at that time took the, we were not going to fan the flames. So I, the larger point is every time you call public attention to some form of this act, what are you calling attention away from? And yeah, leave it at that. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your um, wonderful presentation. I'm still sort of thinking about lots of ideas that you raise and try to build, um, bring together. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is about the internal disagreements that women might have had among themselves yes. over the dis definition of what constituted rape. Yes. And um, actually, where my question was coming from is uh, the book I recently read written by Julia Otsuka. Uh, it's a fictional uh, book about uh, picture brides in uh -huh. the Japanese woman who yes. came to the early part of the 20th century yes. under immigration law, getting very uh, severe and actually impossible for Asian women to become neutralized, uh, naturalized as citizens. Uh -huh. And then there is this sort of kind of memorable scene in which women uh, who came over to the States as picture brides uh, were raped by uh, husband, and uh, that's what the book wants us to think. That was as if it was rape. But then, of course, there were community women within Asian American communities mm -hmm. who would teach those women, no, 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 that's not rape. So that's everything is okay, and it is going to be the part of the Americanization process. So and that's kind of so the the women are married. Women are married, and but on paper they often didn't ever meet the future husband. Right. So but then right. they meet him and the book is portraying the sex within that marriage mm -hmm. as it, that the woman may have not consented but like other women owed it within the marriage contract. Yes, yeah. or the book, author of the book wants the reader <coughs> has to think, oh, it's in the modern perception mm -hmm. that would have counted as rape, but in their context, of course it's not. Right. So, I mean, there is a, a lot of uh, incentive for immigrants in those positions to become Americanized, and the part of that process yes. would involve uh, ability not to see it as a violent uh, act of sexual nature against their bodies. So um, I, I'm just wondering yeah. if, and then I, I'm wondering if you have seen any um, comparable internal conversation that often did not engage the discussion of citizenship because it's right. not as though those women had ability to sort of lay out their disagreements over what constituted as rape. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. about how. I mean, as you mentioned, there is yes. a certain kind of discourse yes. that probably was in constant conflict with yes. um, what those activists might be trying to push right. for. So one way of answering the question is to say uh, the limitations of our sources for knowing about certain So I'm looking at people who are active, writing letters to the editor, editorials, going to court, petitions, trying to change laws. So. The, and I can tell you in the discourse, in the political discourse, that even they were afraid to touch marriage. That's what I, you know, that because they're asking for suffrage. We are unpopular enough. They're claiming that the vote is going to think everything will be topsy turvy and men won't have any power. And there's this cartoon in the book where I show during the suffrage movement where they portray the, the rape of the Sabine women, uh, the founding of Rome, and they show the women being the ones carrying the men off, and when women get suffrage, they're going to do to men. So they're so afraid of turning things topsy-turvy. And the family and marriage is so sacrosanct 
even these political actors don't want to question non-consensual sex in marriage. So I know that from the sources that I've seen. But I don't know in the family or in an immigrant family what the conversation was, what the mentality was, what the negotiation was. And the fiction writer today may have diaries or sources that the writer has been able to see and may have more insight than I do. But that would be a challenge for me to say historically uh, within those communities. But it's a great question to ask um, about citizenship, to add to the mix, which is, Here's your ticket to, well, actually, you didn't have a ticket to citizenship because those men were not citizens. They were oh, citizens. Oh, they were Japanese. That's right, they're Japanese. So they could, gentlemen's agreement, have some citizenship. Chinese men could not at that time. Mm -hmm. But, OK, so here, for at least the Japanese picture brides, this could say, here's your ticket to citizenship. You have to have sex with this man, whether you want to or not. But as you're saying, you have to Americanize, it, or you have to do what everybody does here. Would it have been different in Japan? Well, I don't study Japan, so I don't really know. <laughs> well, that would be the question. In other words, are they coming from a culture in which they had rights to refuse marital sex, or is it the same? Is it continuity? And the community, the ethnic community is saying, you know, this is what it is. So the question is whether the novel you're talking about is an artifact of the 21st century or the late 20th century, I don't know, as opposed to a depiction of what people thought in that community during the picture bride era. What's the name of the novel? Well, it's, I think it's called Buddha in a Deck. That was the title of the book. And it's by Julia Rotsuko. When was it published? Like, Just two years ago. So very recent. Buddha ago. in a Deck. Attic. Attic, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll try it. it I'll, I'll jot it down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi there. I am a um, sexual assault, relationship violence prevention peer educator on campus. So I deal with um, first years and leading workshops talking about like what consent looks like in sexual situations. Mm. And um, one of the things that we deal with a lot that um, first years come in with, and I'm sure um, many people still deal with, is this idea that uh, women lie when they make uh, rape accusations. Oh, yes. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the root of that assumption. Yes, I think it's one of the deepest legacies along with racialization. And I mentioned the stereotypes at the beginning, and I said that women lie, the women are duplicitous. Mm -hmm. Um, the, especially in the, with male citizenship in the early, late 18th, early 19th centuries particularly, this idea that, that men have, there's this now equality, that they have these privileges and these rights, and what can take a man down? One of the things that can take him down, his reputation, his livelihood, is to be accused of what is considered a terrible crime, even though it's rarely punished, but it's still considered a terrible crime. And you begin to see writings, particularly by doctors and jurists, people who are writing uh, in the area of the law, um, cataloging terrible miscarriages of justice of men falsely accused of rape or incest. And they get repeated, the same stories, over and over again. Most of them are from the late 18th or early 19th century, but they're still showing up in print in the early 20th century to argue against the very laws I was talking about, to say, no, we can't change the age of consent laws. There will be so many false accusations. Do you know how many daughters have sent their fathers to the gallows by claiming that they assaulted them? Well, actually not. But they will cite this 100-year-old one example of some Something like that. So I find it right around this sort of republicanism and the the um, the the idea that that that, they, that men have this privilege and that it can be threatened. Um, we see this even today. How sex scandal? Well, less so today, but it, you know, until very recently, how do you bring someone down from a position of power? Sex scandal, um, rape charges, particularly. Why is there? I mean, it's been an incredibly effective defense. You know, one, consent, she, she, she agreed, or she lies that she didn't agree, or just that she lies that it was me, or that she lies that it never happened. It's been very powerful. Um, there was a case in around 1801, 2, 3, somewhere in there, very early republic, 
and a libertine, a somewhat elite man. He's got money, he's got style, he's on the streets, and he picks up this, or he, he meets a working class young woman. Uh, it's kind of a well known case. Uh, and he takes her somewhere, it turns out to be a brothel, he gives her a drink, he has sex with her, she's ruined. Her father brings charges, or she you know, goes to, to the police, he's tried. And his defense lawyer literally says to the jury, are you gonna believe her, are you gonna believe him? We have, and I quote, the life of a citizen in the hands of a woman. In other words, are you gonna take away the rights of a citizen? She's not, you know, she's just a organized woman. And they, um, they don't convict him. And there's a working class riot. I mean, the people are so angry because they see this as class privilege, not just you know, a gender assault, not just a sexual assault. But I just think there's something going on at that time about preserving that, that new manly privilege. But then it just becomes part of the legacy. Um, and a lot of the cases that are cited in the journal literature uh, come from Europe. They keep claiming that oh, men's lives are at stake here. The death penalty for rape is eliminated in the 19th century. Uh, actually, it's not, for most states, it's still there. As it's used for black men. It's not eliminated entirely until the mid to late 20th century. But for the most part, there is not, there, there are very few executions, whether the, the penalty is given or not, for men for rape. And yet there this, there's this story going around that women have it in their power to take away the life of a man or to ruin the life of a citizen by this lying. So I, I just see it right around that time. And I can't pin it down any better for you right now, but I do think it is related to that disparity in, um, in citizenship and the fear of what power do women have. They put this power to take it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll have to think more about it. Yeah. Hi, so um, in response to the um, kind of the uh, statement that there's a culture of disbelief against women who report being raped, um, being here on a college campus, I've heard things such as, um, in response to conversations of rape, such as, you know, she brought it on herself because of what she was wearing, or she should have known better. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like some people assume that a woman should always expect sexual advantages and blame them for being naive if something happens. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how we could um, change this culture of blame on women. Yeah. So one thing is, we can't just, as women change, who has to change? <laughs> Men. <laughs> I mean, that's a, one word answer there, but a whole culture has to help that happen. And so, training men and women, I mean, the kind of work that you're doing, um, particularly from the minute they get here, um, sort of de de explaining where some of the right myths come from and trying to, uh, you know, actually, you might want to use some of these terrible historical quotes that will make men look so bad that they won't want to say these things anymore you know, from the old cases um, and the judges and like, yeah. But um, really, I think that one place, the key place we have to start is not just when you get to college, but it has to be so much earlier in families from the time children are very small. It has to do with respect for women in all realms. You can't just isolate sexual assault and solve it, the more you can create a culture of respect and a belief in inherent human value, regardless of all differences, including gender, sexuality, etc., etc., the more you can create that kind of culture, the easier it will be to pull the rug out from some of those myths. Um, I'm a mere historian, but I really think that the arts have a huge role to play through theater, through culture, through music. Uh, so often I will talk about something in my class and they'll say, oh, yes, there's this, you know, Beyonce said this, or um, oh, it's just like, you know, the, 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 you've got to see this video. The, the, the power, I mean, I don't know, I have to confess, I cried watching the Academy Awards when um, Lady Gaga sang the song from The Hunting Ground, I haven't seen the movie, I can't comment on how accurate it is, but just, and I cried at the thought that millions of people around the world were hearing 
about what happens in campus assault and what it does to people. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I just think that there's a huge role for speaking out, for creating culture that makes people empathize and understand. Um, and you know, this is a question that's interdisciplinary, so I would actually like to open it up to others in the room who thought about how do we undermine this legacy? What do we do now other than slut walks? And you know, I, I, I love seeing the men who come and support or walk in the slut walks. Um, I realize they're controversial in some places. Um, on my campus this year, the multicultural sorority sponsored the slut walk. Um, and made race central to it. Um, in addition, you know, what are you doing on this campus, or what do you want to see in the world to try to undermine these, the victim blaming and the her fault stuff? Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Kitty. I'm a sociology major. And I think a huge part of it is talking about gender and masculinity. Um, obviously, masculinity and hyper masculinity, as it is portrayed in the media, between boys going through puberty, high school, college and the expectation that you have to be a man and you know get the woman and stuff like that yeah there's a lot of violence related to that and rape as a form of violence and a weapon of war and things like that is really scary and we need to talk not just talk to our girls like not just talk to our girls we have to talk to the men too yeah. because that's where it's <clears throat> largely stemming from too like just masculinity as a whole and what's expected of that Interesting you should say that we're having a, an 18-month series on undermining the culture of sexual assault on my campus, and the first quarter this winter was on masculinities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if some of you are familiar with Jackson Katz, who came to speak, and sociologist Michael Messner came to speak, and the football team was required to go, certain fraternities were required to go, and it was great to start the series off by these men who were rejecting male sexual dominance and privilege, and also talking about the complexities of being men doing that and the problematics of it. So I think I agree with you. Yes, another. I'm in theater, so. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I guess what I'm struck by is in this conversation, the, the, and I, I feel like, you know, there's a, a concern right now about sexual assault on college campuses. And we're at one, so yeah. we should attend to that. But the, from what I understand, and I may be, you know, looking at some old numbers, but that, um, you know, most people don't go to college, mm -hmm. um, and so even though we're talking, we have this emphasis on the college as a site for sexual yes. assault, it's actually very much skewing the dialogue yes. and the concern when, I mean, most people are assaulted by someone they know, not at college. Mm -hmm. um, the yes. average age of a child, so-called prostitute, is like 13. Mm -hmm. So we're really, I mean, we're having this conversation yeah. about this kind of flashbed site, yes. but I mean, I, I was thinking also about, you know, what it actually took for black women to be recognized as victims of sexual assault. That doesn't happen until 75, mm -hmm. the Joanne Little case, Bernice Johnson Regan plays mm -hmm. a big role mm -hmm. in her rallying cry, you know, uh, I forgot the song, sorry, I would sing it, but I don't remember. <laughs> Joanne is Joanne, 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 Joanne is me. Yeah. Our the, person is the whole society. society. Yeah. It's yeah. the opening of my first book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I love it. I love it also. Um, <laughs> But I'm just wondering if then, you know, as we're talking about this, like, sites of activism, what, if we're not in some ways reifying this kind of image of yeah. the elite white woman, because yeah. The Hunting Ground, I can't watch that film because yeah. I've already seen enough of the football, the black male football players mm -hmm. and the ad, you know, figured as the, the they're the ones who are dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just insulted by that mm -hmm. uh, imagery, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, but that's too big of a No, no, I think it's a really good, <laughs> you know it's a mean? fabulous We're example. Like <laughs> it's a fabulous example of what I was saying a moment ago about whenever we talk, put our attention in this area, we always have to ask ourselves, what are we not looking at? So it is absolutely appropriate if you're on campus and you're vulnerable and you want things to change to do that. At the same time, it's really important to think, what are the parallel things that are going on? Trafficking is one of them. Uh, we were talking earlier today about the, uh, there apparently was a talk um, recently in the program, if I'm not mistaken, about the oh, huge Campbell's. backlog of unprocessed uh, rape kits. In, this was in yeah. Detroit, Detroit, but yes. you could name a lot of other cities. And I was saying how I would really like to tell my students who are so active in, on campus, like, when you're going to be out of here soon, what about this? Where are you going to go and how are you going to organize about that? 
maybe you can learn your organizing skills working on the campus issue while you're here, but then you could graduate <laughs> to, unfortunately, other terrains, whether it's the military or prisons or the question of the police and what's being processed. Uh, so there's, yeah, not to say you can't be focused on one thing, but you need to be aware of and think about how do you make connections with some of those others. I think that's a wonderful example. Yeah. Um, let's see. Somebody had the hand up over here. Ah, Duncan, you deserve a chance. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, when, uh, yeah, just answering that question, I was thinking um, sort of, uh, we were already talking a little bit about like the police and how this one solution was to have more like women police officers, mm -hmm. which they actually think that's like to like uh, go undercover and trick these people. Yep. I thought that was very clever. But um, I'm wondering. Uh, I know there's some like scholarship about like uh, gay liberation in the '70s and how they were the, uh, victim to police harassment and they built these ally uh, like allies or like alliances with like black community organizations uh -huh. like the Panthers and a lot of others. Yeah. Um, and then at a certain point, they broke off those alliances because uh, uh, they weren't being as harassed as much. But in the process, like the the police state is like built up. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, right. Right. Uh, I'm just thinking about like turning to police as answers to right. to uh, problems with rape. Um, I'm wondering, like, to what extent does that betray other communities that are harassed by police? Uh, it's, it's a great question. First of all, let me clarify: in the earlier period, those first generation of police women um, really die out. There's a long period where they are not involved and, and the, those women were rarely able to actually move out of the sort of woman's beat, if you know what I mean. And it's not until the second wave feminism that there's a demand to bring women in to be there, for example, when women come in and report rape. Um, so that, that, that's just the little history on that piece. The other part, which is that hard choice. And it's about race, but it's about other things too. It's about class as well. About wanting to report, wanting to get justice, wanting to use the, the, the law and the courts. And then how much do you balance that with the ways that that system, the criminal justice system, is discriminatory? I don't know if any of you are familiar with a group called Insight, uh, which questions the use of sort of the criminal justice apparatus, largely about domestic violence, but also about, to some extent, the argument is better on domestic violence. I don't think it's as well worked out on rape. Um, uh, but the question of knowing what you're doing and making choices as opposed to unthinkingly contributing. And that it's not going to be the same answer in every case. So that's what I would say about that. Now, there were some hands on this side of the room, one here and then one here. Yes. Um, I'm an elementary education major, and I see, like, touching on before how we were talking about parallel, mm -hmm. um, how to include a talk of sexual assault in the, uh, through all the, mm, sorry, it's been a long day, um, through all the realms, mm -hmm. and it's really important, at least in my, I work in an elementary school, and it's really pivotal to kind of it really is to teach it at a young age, to teach that respect and that yeah. um, mutual acceptance. I mean, I just had a student today, a six-year-old, who called one of my other students a gay tomboy. And that was, I had to have the conversation. And I, I take it that was not with respect. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> exactly. But I had to have that conversation, right. and I mean, it right. was, you know, it was one of those things that yeah. she learned it from home, yeah. and she learned it from TV. And yeah. you know, as we were talking about it on college campuses, yeah. you know, it really does start at a young age because yeah. you know the kids are getting this from their moms and dads. Yeah. If their moms and dads are, you know, abusive or they watch very um, not age appropriate TV shows, the kids pick up on that. So it's really, I think, imperative from what I've seen to really start at a young age and to really continuously emphasize that as they grow up because I feel like you know somebody could attend a lecture like this just once and you know they're really passionate about it for a few days but then it kind of goes to the back mm -hmm. of their mind mm -hmm. and they slip right back into their routines. Mm -hmm. um, my Aunt Lynn she was actually the first woman border patrol agent ever so that was pretty cool but um, she told me that when she was going through the class you know even though she was supposed to be respected and she was actually outperforming a lot of the other males mm -hmm. in her group that they were continuously like bringing her down and talking down to her even though they, they were in their 
20, late 20s, early 30s, and she just was telling me about how there's just still the lack of respect, even though they had like classes to be like, oh, hey, now that Lynn Hansen is part of this, you know, we have to kind of take her as part of the group. You know, it's not about gender anymore. And so I was just wondering how you would recommend kind of implementing a kind of a continuous respect yeah. through yeah. even just our environment in general. Because I know we're doing some things on college campuses like we were talking right. about, but I, I'm not really that familiar with things that maybe would even like touch on children because yeah. I know some people might think that's inappropriate. How would you? Yeah, so it's not my expertise, but the first thing I want to say is when I talk about what do we do, Thank you for going into this field. We need you. <laughs> and we need to keep that part of the brain going forward so that throughout your career, you can find people to ally with and make change. Um, I think it's, again, not just about we focus on sexual assault. That's part of the package. But um, not maybe for six-year-olds, but certainly somewhere before they get to junior high school, by the end of primary school, they need to learn about sex in a different way than they've been learning about sex. I don't know if anybody saw the Peggy Ornstein piece the other day yes. uh, for, from her new book. Uh, I don't know what the book is called, but you know what what children learn about sex is terrible. I mean, it's either nothing or the worst. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I hate having to go out and just say, "Here's what's bad. Don't do this." You know, it's not even just say no, and it's just like. People say, how are we supposed to say yes? We don't know how to say yes, but because we don't even know how to talk about it. <laughs> um, what kind of communication is there? What do kids learn about self-sovereignty, about their bodies, about respect for people? At what age do they begin to put together um, something more than, let's be afraid of this bad thing? Um, that's not my field, but I, I think that finding people who do sex education in the broadest, most feminist sense, if you will, might be a good resource for a teacher. Awesome. And it, I don't know exactly what age you'll be working with, but even knowing what's coming down the line that they're going to be getting might help. Other, I just wonder if there are children's books. There are. There's actually a video about, I think it was in the Netherlands, and they were teaching sex ed in kindergarten. Yeah. And it was amazing. I mean, they have this uh, statistics that, you know, they're. Uh, amount of rapes and sexual assault yes. like that is yes. like, like extremely low because there's that feeling of mutual respect that's yeah. built up you know at a young age. And I think this was cited in the Ornstein piece too. I don't know if it, I can't remember if it was the Netherlands or some European country where they do compare I mean the United States is doing such a terrible job. We have much worse crime rates, much worse rape rates, all of these mm -hmm. things, um, more than countries where there is sex education as opposed to abstinence education. Uh, so yeah, go for it. And you know, I don't know. You say the six-year-olds, but you know, you got to teach them. Actually, sex is better <laughs> when you know what you want and get it, <laughs> rather than you know, kind of pretending that it's a competition to get what somebody doesn't want. You know, when both people know what they want to get it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. There was one here, and then we'll come over here. Yeah. Um, not to steal your spotlight, but I have some suggestions about this. This is kind of what I wanted to talk about. Was, um, <coughs> when it comes to younger children, we don't teach consent in any form or bodily autonomy. Like as far as I don't want to be hugged right now. Right. Right. Um, I'm 22 years old, and my mom still says, "Oh, you need to give Uncle So and So a hug goodbye." No, I don't. I don't need to do that, Mom. <laughs> I have bodily autonomy. We don't teach our children at all. Yeah. We teach our children, you know, especially our little girls, oh, you know, Bobby hit you. He must have a crush on you. Or uh -huh. he's chasing you around the playground. Yeah. So that equates, you know, abuse equals love. And that gets instilled in children yeah. that are very young, and we need to combat that yeah. and get rid of that and start teaching, you know, um, you know, if someone is touching you or hugging you or you know teasing you, and you don't want that, you have the right to say no. And you know, I think I uh, want to hear the rest of your question, but I think there's a great would be a great project for somebody mm -hmm. in education yeah. to work on what kind of curriculum materials could we develop for 
early education to build the skill building ones, the trainer reels, exercises before you get to the actual sex part. Right. Which just will prepare the you when that comes in. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the project for Yeah. Especially because there's, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. there's a lot of you know contestations about like yeah. teaching that young people, uh, that young you know preschool kindergarten right. about sex. Right. It could just be as simple as. You know, if someone is hugging you or touching you, you don't want them to touch you. Yeah. You, they don't have to. You yeah. can say no. You have the right to your own body. Yeah. And did you have another point? You no, know, I just wanted to great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I also wanted to respond to because there's um, the Unitarian Universalist Church has a like a curriculum called Our Whole Lives, which oh. is a sex ed curriculum that starts in like first or second grade, and it's like very much age appropriate. Um, but it really teaches like the value of boundaries and respecting other people and like you know it starts in second grade so it has to be more so along the lines of that rather than like sex but it goes all the way up until um, like adult education wow. um, yeah so that's a really great resource yeah that's um, great awesome. our Thanks, whole guys. lives from mm -hmm. universalist Unitarians yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, owl. Owl. yeah exactly any other comments or questions before we close well, thank you for what, come here, one last word. Yeah, the last Zion. word. I do one, but it'll be quick. I think that when I think about talking about this type of thing within even the context of my own family, which is, of course, the most like safe and welcoming environment, the difficulty is that when we talk about rape culture, I feel as though, from my experience, we're demonizing men. Mm -hmm. And I think about my dad, my brother, my mm -hmm. boyfriend, and all these men who are would never yeah. do these horrible things. And I think that the reason it's difficult to talk about is because there's not enough emphasis on the fact that men can also be raped. And yes. so we need to be really careful as women, especially for demanding equal respect, to be aware of the fact that men can be victims as well. Yes. Um, and that women can be perpetrators. That's as, correct. Yeah. And I think that's one of the changes in the late 20th century when I talk about gender neutral. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's, it is important that we try to keep our language as gender neutral as we can so that includes all genders or uh, gender abolitionists, as my students would say, um, and to realize it's about the abuse of power and the lack of respect for others. It's not just about male and female. However, historically, the numbers have been so skewed that I think, going back to the earlier comment, we do have to think about masculinity and get all those good men working on that project. OK, thank you. Um, so let's um, give a round of applause for Chris. <laughs>